We're up to chapter 1, Mishnah 15. This is the final teaching of the Zugos, of those five sets of pairs. Uh, last couple of times we had Hillel. Hillel's sparring mate in Torah was, of course, Shammai. Each one of them founded their own institution that would last for more than 100 years. So Hillel and Shammai really are the beginning of the, the major flourishing of oral Torah that's going to really accelerate in the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th centuries. This is Shammai. This is Shammai's teaching. What does he say? Asei Torascha Keva. Make your Torah study a fixed practice. Emor ma'at vasei harbei. Say little and do much. And thirdly, vehavei mekabel tol adam. Saver panim yafot. And receive every person with a pleasant countenance, with a happy and cheerful visage. So, just quickly, who was Shammai? So Shammai, we, we met him in contrast with, with Hillel. Uh, Hillel was really nice to all those nudniks, as we call them in Hebrew, whereas Shammai was a little bit more stern. He was a little bit more strict. Now, it's important to stress that this was not just a character flaw that Shammai had. Shammai had an impeccable character. But Shammai was of the belief that Torah greatness must be revered and it must be put on a pedestal. And you cannot have people who walk over to the great rabbis and start asking them inane questions. And you can't have someone who walks in to convert and says, teach me all of Torah on one leg. And you can't have someone who walks into the great Torah scholar and says, okay, I want to study Torah, but I have some conditions. I want to, I want to, I want to convert, but only I want to accept the written Torah, not the oral Torah. Shammai was the one who was working on preserving the stature of the Torah. And the Torah cannot be mistreated or degraded by people coming in and asking all, and making their own conditions. Whereas Hillel, he was of the position that you have to open up Torah for everyone. In fact, the Talmud does bring a disagreement. Should someone teach Torah to students that are, don't have refined character? According to one opinion in the Talmud, no. Only teach Torah to people that are upstanding and have perfect character. If someone has unsavory character, they have to study Torah on their own, make themselves competent enough before they go into the highest, the major leads where they study with Hill and Shammai. So Shammai was of the belief that no, make Torah exclusive. Right? It's only for the elite. Whereas Hillel, he was of the belief that no, you have to go reach out to everyone and reach out, re- give them Torah on their level. And he was the one who told us, Hillel was, that you have to be like Aaron who loves people and uh, loves peace and brings people close to Torah. Thus, love people, even people that are not of the highest character caliber of personal integrity. Even those people, Hillel was reaching out to them. Whereas Shammai, his position was no, Torah, the, the Torah on the highest level should be reserved for those people who are absolutely perfect. Any of that, but that's, an, that's, that's a halachic disagreement that is manifest in their treatment of others, but not in their own personal character. We find many, some examples in the Talmud of Shammai's uh, scintillating character as well. And and it's interesting. Uh, we'll get to this at the end. But w- what does he what does he say? Like his third clause is receive every person with a pleasant facial expression, with a smile. What is it? Well, who's included in every person? Everyone, even not people who are not great Torah scholars. And thus, it's it's been argued by the commentators, is that Shammai, specifically Shammai tells us that. Every person that you meet, receive them with pleasant uh, pleasant countenance and with a smile, with, with, with cheeriness. To show you that it's not, that, that Shammai's strictness and rigidity is not because of a character flaw or because he advocated uh, being strict per se. Rather, it was related to a separate ideal that he have that he has that Someone cannot be humble if what is at stake is the honor of Torah. And thus, if the honor of Torah is being questioned, there's no room for humility. That was his position. Now, each one of them founded their own institution. It's interesting that the previous four Zugos, the, the Av Beisden, the head of the Sanhedrin, and the Nasi, the president, they always operated together. Only at the fifth instance, which Hila and Shammai, did they each found their own institution down the block from each other. And the reason for that is, like we spoke about when we talked about the history of Hillel, the reason for that is because 
Herod, he made life very difficult for the rabbis. He went on a campaign to assassinate, in fact, all the rabbis in, in Israel, which is why Shammai was one of the only ones who remained. And Hillel actually arrived from Babylon to reinforce the ranks of, of the Torah scholars in the land of Israel. And therefore, it was very unsettling, insecure times for Torah. And thus, they figured instead of having one massive institution where everything's centralized and everything's really on a large scale, where everyone's together and it's a booming institution, let's distribute the, the Torahs and different institutions to make it smaller, make it a little bit more modest, and not to raise the ire of the authorities. And as a result of that, because there was separation between all the scholars, this led to different streams of thought. There wasn't the unity that allowed Torah to continue without many departures from the consensus. And therefore, during this time, during the first century of the Common Era, we see the rise of machlokas. Machlokas means halakha disagreements. Why? Because you have the house of Shammai and the house of Hillel, and these institutions developed their own modes of relating to Torah, and thus they drew the halacha in their own distinct ways. And because they drew the halacha in their own distinct ways, every once in a while they come together and compare notes and say, no, 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 we came to the opposite conclusion. And thus they would have debates. Now, the, it's important to stress that the debates are usually, or in fact, no, they're always on the most, not the most, but on very minute aspects of halacha. Like, there's no debate can you eat pork? Can you not eat pork? There, is, there that, that does not appear in the Talmud. I'll give you a classic example of a Talmudic debate between Hill and Shammai. Base Hill and Base Shammai. The house of Hill and the house of Shammai. The Talmud talks about the laws of the Leverite marriage. Leverite marriage is when you have a two brothers. One of them is married to a woman. And he dies without children. So the Torah tells us, we'll see it later on in Deuteronomy, that in this case, the, br- the other brother, his brother, the brother of the deceased husband, he has to marry or do chalitza, basically a divorce, that woman, his sister-in-law. Because the brother died without children, and therefore he has no legacy, and his brother that's still alive should marry the widow of his deceased brother in order to give a legacy for the dead brother. That's the Torah's teaching in the book of Deuteronomy, Laws of Yibum. The Talmud discusses an instance where two brothers, called Reuven and Shimon, Reuven is married to two women. One of them happens to be his niece, which is Shimon's daughter. So Reuven and Shimon, Reuven has two wives, we we'll call her Rachel and Leah, but Rachel happens to be the daughter of Shimon, his brother. Neither of them have any children, and Reuben dies. So what do you have? You have an instance where Shimon now has the option to marry one of these two women that are his brother's widows. But one of them happens to be his own daughter. So obviously he can't marry his own daughter. But the question is, can he marry the other one? She's his sister-in-law, but she's not his daughter. Yeah. So she's only related vis-a-vis his relationship with his brother. Can he marry what's called the Tsaras Habas, co-wife of the daughter? So the Talmud brings a verse. It's very complicated. The Talmud, the book of Ivamos. I spent like good chunks of my life studying these things. The Talmud says that, no, he's not allowed to marry not. Shimon is not allowed to marry not. His daughter, of course not. That No one entertains that possibility. But even the other wife, the co-wife, it's either all or nothing. If you can't marry one, you can't marry the other either. That's the position of Beis Hillel. Comes along Beis Shammai and says, no, of course I'm not your daughter, but you're allowed to marry the other wife. Your sister-in-law, that's only related to you because she was married to your deceased brother, Reuven. That's the argument. And it's interesting The Talmud actually, when it talks about this particular argument, it says, okay. So you have Shammai and his academy saying that it's okay. And you have Hill and his academy that's saying, no, it's not okay. And in fact, this is a prohibited relationship because she's your sister-in-law. And the only time that you're allowed to marry a sister-in-law is in an instance 
where this prohibition was lifted because of the case of Yibam, of a Leverite marriage. But in this case, because the co-wife is your daughter, prohibition was not lifted, and therefore you're not allowed to marry her as a sister-in-law. And if you do, the kids are the kids of moms there. So what happens? Beis Shammai says, you're allowed to marry her. It's a mitzvah, in fact, to marry her. And those kids are totally fine. Beis Hill says, you're prohibited to marry her. And those kids are considered a moms there. So the Talmud says is that in each academy, they, they would observe their position. And then still, the students of Shammai and students of Hill would intermarry with each other. But they would inform them, you know what? You probably don't want to want this family. Because according to your position, this family, they're bastards. Uh, and the Talmud also says is that when they had disagreements vis-a-vis halacha of kosher, so suppose you're from the Academy of, of Hillel, and your neighbor's from the Academy of Shammai, and you want to borrow a pot to make pasta. Are you allowed to borrow a pot? Because maybe this pot was used for something that according to you is a problem, according to them is totally fine. Because they're from a different school of thought. Says the Talmud, they would still lend each other pots, but they would inform them, okay, this pot you shouldn't use because this one I did use for something that you would find problematic. So what happened? So what's the end game over here? After the temple was destroyed, and they went to Yavne, and they had the Sandra in Yavne, the primary objective of the academy in Yavne right after the temple was destroyed is to end this. To end this growing schism. And they spent years clarifying every debate between Shammai and Hillel, not, not Shammai and Hillel themselves. Shammai and Hillel had very few disagreements. It was only the academy of Shammai and the academy of Hillel, based Shammai and Hillel. They spent years working on all those disagreements and came to consensus. And the Talmud even adds that they spent three years arguing all these laws. Who's right? Shammai or Hillel? And they concluded definitively that they're both right, they're both Torah, but the halacha follows base Hillel. And, that's, and, and then everyone agreed there was a consensus uh, around that position, and that was finalized for, forever. Yes, so again, so there's a, it's a schism based upon the reality that was on the ground when Beis Shammai and Hill were formed, but that lasted up until about the year 80 or so, when in Yavne, they brought all the Torah scholars back onto one canopy and to one academy in Yavne. Okay, so what, is, what does Shammai say? First thing he says, Ase Torah keva, make your Torah a fixed routine. So on a simple level, what does this mean? We should have time assigned to study Torah. Says the Talmud, one of the first questions that someone gets asked after they die is kavata item la Torah. The word kovea. It was a keva. You make a fixed time for Torah study. Shammai is telling us we we have to make Torah an integral part of our schedule. But on, on a deeper level, what this means is that if the Torah is affixed, what is everything else? Everything else is not affixed. If the Torah has a fixed routine, it implies, and the Talmud actually says this, make your Torah, make that fixed, make everything else unfixed. What it's telling us is, is that the Torah should not be just a thing that you do. It is the thing that you do, and everything else is secondary and tertiary. But it's also not measured by time. So some will say, well, listen, I, I can only study an hour a day. But if, the, if that is, so to speak, the time that you're alive, that's the special, that's my time. That's the time that matters. And the other 23 hours that I'm busy, okay, that's what I need to do to live. Then you're fulfilling what Shammai is instructing us. Whereas if someone says, I'm studying 23 hours a day, but really I'm alive during the other time where I finally have a break, then you're not fulfilling his dictum. Uh, you know, people today, they work the whole week. Oh, thank God it's Friday. I have my life, my weekend. Like this is what I'm really living for. So when they're actually alive is when they're is is during the weekend when they're not working and they're not alive for the majority of their time because that's just a way to enable their life on the weekends. Similarly, with respect to Torah, says Shammai, if you have to try to be alive, your relation with Torah has to be such that you're actually more alive when you're studying it, and everything else is just a way to get there. And that's not respective of how much time someone can only dedicate a certain amount of time. That's not his point. The point is, but if that time is the most special, the most sacrosanct, 
and the time where they're most alive. And the commentaries add here, the Rabbeinu Yonah, for example, he says there's actually consequences to this point. He says that when someone makes their Torah primary and everything else secondary, then that is exactly the way they tr- are treated in Olam Abba, in the afterlife. The way you treat Torah in this world is the way you get treated in the next world. That's what Rabbeinu says, which is a little bit of a scary idea. It's not about how much Torah you study, uh, Torah that you do. It is what is the relationship that you have with Torah. If you make Torah primary, then you will be primary in the next world. If you make Torah secondary, then you will be secondary in the next world, which is, again, shows us the eternal consequences of this idea. It says the Rambam in his commentary. Very fascinating. What does it mean that make the Torah primary? Says the Rambam, make the Torah the root and the basis that all your other actions derive from. What he's telling us is, is that Torah should extend beyond the confines of a book or of a study session. Torah should be the influence that's guiding your whole life. And therefore, every behavior should be seen and experienced and exhibited through the prism of of Torah. Torah is fixed, and that's how you see the world, and that's how you interact with the world, and thus all your behavior is influenced by Torah. And there are some stories about the great sages that they would never do anything unless they knew a Torah source mandating that. And they were very fixed, like th- that, that was the filter that everything passed through. The Torah that they had studied that influenced their behavior in a way that everything that they, everything else they did followed, flowed from that from that Torah. Someone could be a farmer and say, okay, what am I doing here? I'm farming. Why am I farming? Because I want to be able to feed my family. That's a mitzvah. Right? The Torah tells me feed your family. That's one of my responsibilities. Many mitzvahs that you could do as a farmer. You plant these seeds and you start praying that the Almighty should give you plenty of rain, but not too much. There's a way to involve Torah even in, in the most mundane activities. Right? When we eat a sandwich, we make a bracha. What does eating a sandwich have to do with God? The answer is really nothing. Even people who don't have any relationship with God also eat sandwiches, so I've heard. Right. If someone is, is following what the Rambam is telling us is that the Torah is fit and it's influenced everything, even something which could be mundane, like eating a sandwich, you make a bracha, you bring God into it, and thus Torah is influenced that as well. And Rabbi Yitzchak Velazhner, the son of Rabbi Chaim Velazhner, he adds a point that the word keva, say Torah keva, make your Torah fit, make it eternal, make it firm within you. What that means is that take the Torah and absorb it in your heart. And thus, the Torah, even when you're not studying, the Torah is still with you because you have integrated it within you. You've installed it within you. And thus, you are like a portable Torah because you have it now installed within you. The next part of Shammai's teaching is speak little and do a lot. And I would I would argue that this is something which is uh, maybe a diminishing still in our world. People are big talkers, but don't necessarily do a lot. Now, the Talmud actually says, gives us examples of this. The Talmud in Book of Bum, it's on page 87a, it talks about Abraham. So Abraham, in one of the major episodes that were told about his life, he's 100 years old, or 99 to be precise. He's been recently circumcised. And he is waiting outside for guests. And three angels, masquerading as people, appear. And he runs over to them and tells God, wait a second, I've got to deal with these, with these visitors. And he tells them, I want to give you a little bit of bread. Stop here, I'm going to give you some bread. What does he say? He says, I'm going to give you bread. What does he do? He gets three animals, three cows, and he brings bread and butter and everything. He really has a, a massive 12 course gastronomical affair. So, again, this is an example, says the, says the Talmud, of the tzaddikim, the righteous. They say a little, but they do a lot. Whereas the wicked, it's the opposite. They talk big and they deliver very little. And what's the example of that? It gives us the example of Ephron. Ephron, he was the owner of the cave that Abraham wanted to buy for, for to bury Sarah. And initially, Ephron's like, I'm going to give it to you for free. Ah, you're so special. You're so holy. You're so righteous. It's it's on the house. That's what he said. He said a lot. But when 
brass tacks. When, when push came to shove, he's like, give me 400 silver coins that are universally accepted. Exorbitant fees, very little action. Now, the commentaries tell us that this is also the ways of the Almighty. The Almighty also speaks very little, but does a lot. I would say, if you look at Genesis, right? There's ten, ten utterances that God makes, but look at the world that we live in. For ten words, this is a lot that we got, a lot of action. But the commentaries tell us that if you look at the time where God promised the Exodus, in chapter 15 of Genesis, by the covenant of the parts, God tells Abraham, you should surely know that your descendants will be foreigners in a foreign land. They'll make them work. They'll torment them for many years. But when they leave, I'll judge them. I'm going to judge, judge the Egyptians. So the comment the Midrash tells us that God uses only two letters to say, I'm going to judge the Egyptians. God speaks very little. But then you read Exodus and all the miracles and all the plagues and the splitting of the sea and incredible action that God actually did. Says Rabbi Yonah, if you look at Jewish literature, you find many, many references to a future redemption, to a future Exodus, so to speak. And if two words brought us the miracles of the Exodus, how many more words do we have about the future redemption and thus how much greater orders of magnitude greater even than the Exodus? We have something exciting to look forward to. The other Ruach Haim, the other commentary here, he has a novel interpretation of what it means say a little and do a lot. He understands the entire Mishnah talk about Torah study. So the Mishnah begins, make, make Torah study permanent. Well, what if someone already studies? And you're like, ooh, I, I studied so much. Says the next clause of the Mishnah, say a little, do a lot. When you're analyzing what you have already studied, you should say, consider it, eh, it's only a little. And therefore still do a lot. The more someone is content and complacent with their current accomplishments, the more likely they are to not achieve further ones. And thus, as a tactic, we've seen this one before, if you think about how much you don't know and how much more there is to study, you're more likely to pursue it. Whereas if you think about, oh, I've, I've done so much already, I'm good. I have everything safely in the bank. You're not likely to pursue further greatness. And we have a pedal to the metal attitude to really try to achieve greatness and to never stop improving. Finally, says Shammai, greet every person with a pleasant countenance. The officer of Nassan elaborates, suppose you have someone comes to uh, visit you and ask for a favor. You know, in our neighborhood, we get a steady stream of people fundraising door to door. Many of them came from Israel. They go to different Jewish communities and they go fundraising. So what happens? Someone comes to your door. So you have two options, right? You could give them a small donation, give them a big donation. Someone comes to ask you, you got to give them something. But how much you give, that's up to you. You give them $3, you give them $300. There are different kinds of donations you could give. Says the Midrash here, if someone gives their friend all the gifts in the world, but their face is, is mean, it's not nice, it's not pleasant, then it's as if the Torah considers if you give them nothing. Whereas, if someone greets their fellow with a joy, with, joy, with cheeriness, with a smile, with a pleasant countenance, even if he doesn't give him anything, because very little, it's considered as if you gave him everything. To give a smile to someone doesn't cost something. You don't have to go into uh, overdraft to give someone a smile. It's, it's free. And here we're told that this is, this is what matters. Even if someone cannot afford to give a lot, but if it's done in a very cheerful way, that is valued a lot. Rabbi Ezra Salanta, the founder of the Muslim movement, 1810 to 1883, he had a line that he used to say. He said, in the Talmud, there is the concept of public domain and private domain. You know, my house, my lawn, that's my own house. But the street, that's called public domain. That's for everyone. Says Rabbi Israel Salanta, your heart is private domain. Your face is public domain. And therefore, if you're mis you're in a bad mood. So you could be in a bad mood in your private domain. But no one else needs to suffer. Your face, the way you treat other people, that has to be pleasant. You always have to have a smile, even if you're in a rusty mood. That's fine to be in a rusty mood. Keep that 
in your heart. No, no one else needs to suffer because you're in a bad mood. And therefore, your face has to always be shining. And I have a personal story here with my great-grandfather, Rabbi Abraham Grzynski. He was the head of the yeshiva in Slabotka in Lithuania. And sadly, him and his family were incarcerated in the Kovna ghetto for many years. It was one of the big ghettos in Lithuania. And conditions were very, very poor, of course. And there was people being killed all the time. But he had spent two years of his life working to try to integrate within himself this particular Mishnah. To greet every person with a pleasant countenance. And there are testimonies. He sadly was killed in 1944. But there are testimonies of eyewitnesses who encountered and interacted with him during during those terrible years in the ghetto. And they said, no matter how bad things were, he was always smiling. He was always giving people a positive countenance. And one final story of a student who arrived in the Musar Yeshiva in Kelm. And he said he arrived, he was young, and he was embarrassed to walk in because he didn't know anyone. And you know the way it's like if you're like outside the door and everyone's inside, everyone knows each other, and you feel like an outcast or an outsider. So he was deliberating in the vestibule of the base madrash in the yeshiva. So someone walked out and says, oh, welcome, and give him a smile, and how was your trip, and how are you doing? You must be really hungry. Let me get you something to eat. Let me fix you something to take care of you. He's like, guys, like, wow, this guy must know me. I, I don't seem to recognize him. But he's like clearly behaving like he knows me. Okay, it's good to have friends, and uh, fine, I'm, I guess I'm not alone. I don't remember who he is, but he must have known me. The next guy walks out, and same thing. Oh, how you doing? Welcome. And he smiles at him. It's so nice to have you here. We're waiting for you. Well, he must know me as well. And then he found out later on. He's like, no, no, no. That's the way everyone treated everyone there. Because the, the Musa attitude is to say, even the little things, you know, smiling at people, like, what value does that have? It's not, it's not going to change who you are. No, the little things actually make the impact. My grandfather would advise people to spend maybe a couple of months and trying to be pleasant to a people you meet. Then he would tell his students, three times a day, I want you to smile and greet and be warm to strangers. And even people that, you know, that are cashier or the bus driver, people that you don't know, it's maybe a little bit uncomfortable, but it's trans- transformative because it's the beginning of caring about other people. It's the beginning about the first step to love others as yourself is to greet them with a pleasant countenance. Thus, uh, Shammai gives us very powerful lessons about how to integrate Torah into our behavior, how to not be a big talker, to try to amplify our actions and minimize our speech, and finally, to greet everyone with a pleasant countenance and thus develop an attitude of love and friendship and camaraderie with other people. And next week, I'll see everyone at Yom Mood. I look forward to seeing you then, and we'll reconvene in two weeks with the next Mishnah of Chapter 1, Perkyavos.